I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and every once in a while, I don't mind coming on here and breaking a few narratives, like busting some narratives down, and I feel like that's basically what's going to happen here today. And and here to do that with me is my good friend, Perch, as we talk about the 2019 sales and kind of what it all means. What's up, buddy? Hey, uh, doing well. Uh, glad to be on. And uh, like you, I, I love uh, correcting <laughs> narratives here. And there's there's everybody likes to look at these reports and then take their own thing out of it. And very few are always right. So uh, this could be a great day. Well, there are certainly some ways that you can spin these things, you know, towards one uh, narrative or another. But we'll, we'll try and pro provide the most accurate assessment that, that we can with the numbers that are available. Now, obviously, we know uh, a lot of people have been saying the comic book industry is dying. You know, comic book medium is dying in North America. That is obviously not true because overall comics and graphic novel sales rose 11% in 2019 to $1.2 billion, mostly due to continued rapid gains in graphic novel sales in the book channel. Although there were single digit sales growth in period periodical comics within the direct market. we I do want to also point out that they, were, they made two uh, changes in methodology when account accounting for these numbers. They started. They are now including an estimate of graphic novels sold by comic stores from sources other than Diamond Comic Distributors, which is obviously going to add to these sales numbers. And they also refined their method for accounting for comics shipped overseas. But that that should even out the, the way they explained it. So that should probably not really change anything here. It's but, probably going to give things a slight boost over time. And I think it, it paints the historical picture a little bit better um, mm -hmm. in terms of a little bit more accurate. So I think it's it's probably a tiny net positive. Like you say, these two things cancel each other out to some extent. But it probably, if it's if it's going to fall one direction or another, it probably uh, you know positively impacts business. But it's also more accurate. So it's it's a, this is a good thing. This is a, it's it's good corrections to make, and I think we're looking at more accurate numbers and, and the big picture. Uh, that said, there's one caveat in all this, and. Um, and in addition, is there still some numbers I think that escape out of out of this whole picture? And I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But I think there's still some things that are not being counted that probably should. And and we, like I said, we'll get into it as we go through the numbers. So, like I said, 1.2 billion dollars, and this is what John Jackson Miller had to say about these numbers. Print comic sales had never before topped 1 billion in current dollars, and one has to go back to the boom of the early 1990s to find sales at or above the level when adjusted for inflation. So even if you look back and look at in context of what the sales were in the 90s, the big boom period, the numbers are similar, if not a little bit, a bit up right now. Yeah, they, they are, I, I think. And this is where, this is the most important part to, I think this entire graph and how you look at it and everything else is, like you said at the beginning, a lot of people like to claim their own kind of narratives out of this. Um, this is comic sales. It's a giant umbrella. When when people look at this chart and they see this stuff going up, they're like, aha, see, Marvel and DC doing great. It's This isn't Marvel or DC. This isn't any one thing. This is a giant umbrella of comic sales. And over time, historically, like the last 60 years or so, um, things come in and out. We saw the newsstand. We saw the direct market. We've seen the graphic novel market. We've seen now Scholastic, other things. There's, there's a lot of things that go into comics. So everybody has their own view of what comics means. And so they tend to put that view into these numbers. And this was what's the key here is these graphs over time, different things are leading these numbers. And, and so it's this isn't like saying, hey, Marvel and DC are doing great. It's not saying Scholastic are doing great. It's saying the whole business is up. And the whole business is up. That is a fact. But it's it's much bigger than the business that many people normally talk about. So one thing we have to key on in on here is there has been a change in the market, and this has been happening at least over the last five years. And this is what uh, Milton Greep, who, who runs ICV2.com, had to say. The massive shift to graphic novels as the preferred format for comics continued in 2019, bringing sales in the comic book channel above the comic store channel in North America for the first time in the history of the medium. So we've seen the market has been changing. The, the sales for kind of uh, periodicals within the direct market have been pretty flat, but we've seen this massive growth happening in other channels, uh, big box stores, you know, bookstores, obviously scholastic book fairs and things like that. And that just continued. And this is the first year when that portion of the market accounts for more revenue 
than the direct market through comic book stores. Exactly. And I think that this is another case where there's a couple sources I suspect that are still not being counted properly, which would boost this number up even further. I think that the the secret or the 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 you know not so secret secret in the comic industry is that for several years now, major online retailers, uh, places like Amazon, big box chains, uh, Scholastic, um, have been a just a powerhouse in this business, largely driven by a couple of properties that have have really done well, and and that's what's driving the market. So I think actually it's. Uh, my suspicion is that this is this has been going on for a little bit longer than people think. That that the direct market has been under this number for for a while, and and just as we're starting to get more sales figures and more things to create this picture, we're seeing that uh, actually this this shift happened a couple of years ago, and this isn't something new. So you think with a different uh, level of accounting a couple of years ago that was more in line with what we're seeing today, we wouldn't see like the eleven percent growth. It would be a little bit smaller, but we would still be seeing growth in, in yeah. markets outside the direct market. I do. And, and I think that it, I, I both believe that and I also believe that it, it paints the picture that some of these other efforts, some of the Raina Telmigers, Adab Pilkey, some of these other people that we never talk about in comics have been have been leading a huge part of this picture for, for a bit longer than we thought. Uh, really, this only came on to, you know, people came became aware of it within comics, it seems like, uh, you know, one to two years ago where people really started talking about it. Uh, some always knew, but but many people just didn't consider that a factor. And I think this has been kind of warping the picture for at least four to five years. And what's interesting about this is we, we've seen lately, obviously DC Comics has put a big emphasis on these YA graphic novels, trying to reach those markets, the, these markets that are outside the direct market. Marvel just announced a, a deal with Scholastic where basically they're bringing the the Marvel heroes that we know, at least you know a, a few select heroes, putting them into this uh, the scholastic market where they're really targeting kids in between the ages of like five to fourteen, somewhere in there. Obviously, Marvel and DC have seen the direct market is very important, but for growth and sustained growth, they need to look to these markets that are actually uh, experiencing growth outside and try and bring their characters out to these mediums as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and this all goes back to if you're if you're looking at the full picture, and you see that like to, you know a handful of authors or people within Scholastic are are dominating you know the traditional publishers and and again have for probably a while. I mean, this this picture you have right here, the graphic novels picture, um, this is is really dominated by a couple names, and you have in inside of, of periodical comics, regular floppy comics, you have. You know, anywhere from you know a thousand, whatever it is, it ships a month, like five, six hundred books plus a month. Forty percent Marvel, thirty percent DC. Yeah, about five to ten percent Image, and then a bunch of other uh, publishers. Exactly, and but with a ton of a ton of different offerings, and mm -hmm. a lot of different authors, a lot of different costs, and everything else, and you you stack that against what's really you know less than ten, and and in many cases, the bulk of these numbers are happening from less than five in the graphic novel market and it's just it's that's so if you're marvel or dc and you're looking at this and you want a piece of that action you kind of have to because your business is being dwarfed by that um you you have to get in you have to do it so that's that's definitely why they're they're there <laughs> if we take it back from the the two markets that we're primarily talking about here the book channels and comic stores and we look at the formats and we really see the huge difference where graphic novels are outpacing the sales of periodic comic books by over you know two to one, yeah. Obviously, you get a lot more sales you know per dollar per book for graphic novels. But I'm a little bit surprised by this number, and it really feels like the future of the comic book industry is graphic novels, specifically aimed at, at younger audiences. Marvel and DC need to know need to figure out a way to kind of translate like this to this audience, but also translate it to that younger audience and probably need to start investing more heavily in graphic novels, including image and the other competitors. Well, they've got to figure out a story for it. I mean, the reality is like this picture, like we were talking about before, if we look at comic books um, at 355 million, um, going into that is is for the course of a year, I, I, you know, what, like 20,000 20, different books are published to make up that number. In the graphic novel area at, at double, um, it's, it's, you know, a, a 50th of that, just a fraction of that is making up that number. So it's, it's not only is it, is it so much higher in dollars, 
it's also the the per unit sales the attach rate of these sales is is just completely off the chart so it's just such it's a better investment it's just a, a much better return for those areas but again a lot of people look at this and they're like oh so you're talking like uh you know collections of uh of like war of the realms the graphic novel no that's not really a part of this picture at all this is driven by uh people who are not marvel and not dc that's that's the reality of, of this graphic novels number so that just gives even more urgency for the big publishers to figure out how they play in this space because their offerings really are insignificant uh, in this overall picture. Yeah, it, it's crazy. And it kind of gets you worried if you think about, you know, the traditional comic book market in, in North America when people think DC and Marvel, but it's been stagnant. And you look at the, the growth for periodicals, they, they call it, you know, uh, in the mid, you know, uh, single digit growth. But really, that's all accounted for by rising cover prices, units uh, shipped is actually down. Whereas we're seeing this rapid growth in the graphic novel like format, which is gonna have to, to lead to some changes. If DC, Marvel, Image, they wanna keep up with the market and the way it's changing, they're gonna have to change the way that they're writing these stories. I know we've make, made a lot of fun about, you know, Ben to speak or writing for the trades and things like this, but I think they're probably gonna have to start looking at writing for the trades, releasing these in comic book format. And like, so something that that's coming out soon, Ten of Swords. I don't believe that that story going through however many issues is now like 24 or something like that, that will not translate as a story in a graphic novel very well. Whereas no. something like, like uh, Dark Knight's Death Metal, where it's kind of like five or six issues probably does. So I think they're going to have to see DC and Marvel change the way they look at these stories and the way that they tell them. Yeah, for sure. I, I think the uh, the episodic storytelling that some authors use for for periodicals, and even though, for example, you mentioned Bendis, he writes for trade, but he also has. I mean, he will he will use up, you know, three or four issues in that trade with uh, with kind of dialogue and characterization and other things that don't necessarily translate either to this market. I, the target. The people who are leading this business, again, are not Marvel or DC. They have an established way that they're writing these books with as, as almost long one shots. They're far more equivalent to the kind of the 1980s Marvel epic line and some of those some of those books that came out that way. And you mentioned uh, uh, Death Metal or Metal. I think books like Civil War uh, fit this perfectly where you can kind of you just got one story and it, it goes from start to finish. That's what's going to succeed in this market. Uh, because that is what is succeeding in this market. So if Marvel and DC want to jump on board, they're going to have to kind of rearrange their storytelling. Uh, giant crossovers, things like uh, even things like uh, like Empire and Ten of Swords, it, it does not fit well into this format, it, especially with the way they do all the crossovers and the tie ins and and kind of tee up one event for another event. It doesn't give that kind of uh, end to end story that is successful. So purchase times to start busting another narrative. And that's one that I'm seeing a lot on social media and in other places where a lot of these, uh, you know, Marvel, DC image, you know, comic book writers are going out there and see booms told you com comic book market is stable. You know, we're seeing growth. Everything's fine. In fact, everything's getting better. Yeah. Things are getting better in another demographic of the market. What you guys are doing is, is stagnant. It is stale. If, if anything, units are down. And so the interest is, is actually going down. You don't get to claim, you know, this kind of success because you weren't a part of it. And it's time for them to acknowledge that while, yes, comic books as a medium are, are growing, but it's because of something someone else is doing. Uh, basically, they kind of created their own market and it's time for them to start adapting instead of acting like this is a part of their success, too. Yeah, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? I think that um, you are seeing a lot of people saying, see, the comic market is doing great. Yeah, the comic market is doing great. That is true. But the definition of comic book market is is different from what, what a lot of these people are claiming. It's, it's much bigger. When they say comic book market, they're kind of using it as a catch-all term to really talk about you know, the books that are coming out from the big two. And that's, that's not what's doing great. That's not what's... Uh, I mean, it, you mentioned before, sales are up for periodicals, but price tag is up. If you look at the 2019 numbers, you see a lot of them are driven by these uh, landmark, you know, 1,000 issues that are overpriced, uh, you know, $10 cover prices. And that drives a lot of the dollar sales. But it's not in, you know, just looking at the chart, um, almost everything here 
is either a number one, an anniversary issue, or was part of the House of X Powers of Ten line. That's that's really you have to go a long way to get down to something that isn't part of that run. So so it's it's people just have to look at this and say, you know, the comic market is doing great. Are you, when you're talking about what you're doing, are you working in the part of the comic market that's doing great or not? I mean, you could say technology is doing great, but if you're working at IBM, it's a much different story than if you're, you know, making phones for Apple or, or you know, work at Zoom. It's, it's, it's a catch-all term and some people are doing great in it, some people are not. Definitely people need to adapt. And, and by the way, the, the other part of this is this is where a number of creators will come in and say, but this is what we've been saying for the last five years, that we need to have these other stories. We need to bring in these other people and we need to diversify what it is we're doing in terms of our line. Yes, that's also true. But doing different periodicals, putting a different uh, creator on Spider-Man and churning those things out is not exactly chasing Raina Telmiger for her dollars. That's you're still playing in the wrong field. So I'm sorry to burst some people's bubble. If, if you're that creator that's flying that flag and saying, look, $1.2 billion sales, you know, Marvel and DC are still doing great. Sorry. Those $1.2 million sales at 11% growth, it's not due to the to, to traditional markets. It's because other markets are growing. I mean, if, now, you we have, do, if they have a great plan, by the way, for how they're going to go and tap into this other market and you recognize that the growth is happening in these other areas and you're going to go chase it, Man, that's awesome. Then you are on the right page. Then, then fly that flag and be proud and, and make your content changes. But if it's just, hey, everything's going great for me, it's like, no, the growth is happening somewhere else. You either got to figure out how to get there or kind of acknowledge that things are, are collapsing in your side. Mm -hmm. The other thing we need to talk about is it's quite evident in this graph. Digital sales, they've basically been flat for a decade or so. Although I will say this, the sales numbers, the digital sales numbers here do not include subscription-based all-you-can-read services. So your Comixology, your Marvel Unlimited, um, mm. you know, DC uh, Universe type, type of stuff. So those numbers would be higher. Obviously, DC is attacking that market. They're doing a lot of D DC digital, DC digital first, digital only releases. Marvel is starting to, to kind of look that way. If they want this to grow, they're going to have to invest in it. They can't just treat it as an afterthought. Yeah, they need a plan. And, and the growth is going to be in this subscription, all you can eat or just some different service. And that is where the growth is going to be. So it'll be interesting to see those numbers. I, I hope I would love to see how that's been tracking year over year, if they've been able to grow and get more. Subscriptions have been growing. Yeah. Yeah. That we need to see what that looks like. Um, and I, I'd be very curious because that is the future. Um, digital continues to be like we've talked about many times. It's just an afterthought. It's 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 not anything anybody is really putting time toward. And every time I say this, at least on one of my videos, uh, somebody will come in and go, I'm a collector, I'll never read digital. I get that, that's fine, that is your choice. But the reality is digital is a market that needs to be explored, especially if we're talking about comics in this bigger bubble, if we're talking about it with, uh, with all the different formats, not just what we traditionally think of with Marvel and DC. Digital has a role to play here. And somebody, you know, it needs to be figured out, it needs to be explored, and, and to date, the, the whole concept of digital has been largely punted. Now, DC is doing some things now. That's good. I think, uh, you know, the subscription services that they're they're pushing are, are good. It, this will start to grow. It is inevitable, um, it, but it, it does need some more people leading. It needs more effort. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to continue to trail. All right, Perch. So, obviously, this is a snapshot in time of something that happened, you know, basically... 18 months to six months ago, you know, this is 2019. We're already over halfway through 2020 and a lot has changed. We're, our, we're still in the middle of, of COVID-19. Uh, obviously, the, the shutdown's uh, been lifted to some degree, but we're still dealing with that. DC has abandoned Diamond, you know, within the last few months. Uh, Diamond don't appear to be on good footing right now. We don't know how long they're going to last. We don't know how strong they are. Uh, DC and Marvel are putting far more emphasis on, on young reader and YA graphic no novels, uh, primarily outside the direct market. What do you think we should look for in 2020? Obviously, there's going to be a massive decrease in, in the numbers. What can the, the comic book industry do, specifically you know, de uh, the direct market, to kind of salvage this year? Uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's it's got to be a rebuilding year. It's got to be a place where we're, we're plotting how 2021 is going to go. This year is, I don't want to say a loss, but it, it kind of 
Yeah, it's it's not, it's not exactly. It's just the the actions you take today are going to salvage next year. So that's what you know. What should be happening right now is definitely a move for how um, you know the big publishers, the traditional publishers, uh, crack into digital and start to play there. Um, definitely, you know, digital planning needs to be put together because anything that happens right now is really not going to have a big impact until January or February of next year. So it's this now is a time that that work needs to be done. Um, what you hope is that this uh, COVID destruction did not uh, distract the company so much that they're they're still in a rebuilding phase of just getting going. It looks like DC is firing on all cylinders, really trying to tackle this market um, and and plan for the future. Um, Marvel, it's it's hard to say. This Glastic announcement was a positive one for them, but but then outside, so we wind up talking a lot about those guys. Um, the thing I'm going to be very interested in is you know they're forgetting about Marvel and DC and Image and those companies for a moment. Uh, other people in the world are looking at the success of, of what's happened at Scholastic and graphic novels and everything else and seeing a really good entry point. You see people with brand new properties did not have any, you know, any history beyond, uh, you know, a few years ago. And they are they're able to, to really capture this market. So I think you, you're probably going to see other people enter into this and, and come out with other formats. I mean, it, this channel has now been very firmly established. We know that the YA audience is there if you, you put proper attention toward it. And I think you're going to see some new players uh, enter the picture. And, and really, that's where, uh, as we look at this chart of graphic novels to comic books to digital, um, I, I fully expect that this, this green line, the graphic novels line, is just going to continue to expand and grow while comic books kind of stutters along. I, unfortunately, I do not think comic books and monthly periodicals have a lot of room to raise a cover price much. I, I think they've, they've boosted as, as pretty much as high as they've gone. They've got the anniversary issues in there. There's not another moment where they can, you know, kind of sneak in a little bit more dollar sales by, by raising the prices over the next two years. It's just going to be extremely hard to do that. So I, I just see this gap widening further and further. It is going to be very interesting. Obviously, DC has got... Um... Dark Knight's Death Model, all the way going going out to 2021. We got Joker War happening. Marvel's got three big events. Empire, Ten of Swords, right into um, the King in Black, which is, I believe will go into 2021. So it feels like they've kind of got their plan to the end of the year, but I think you're right. I think we're going to see a lot of very interesting announcements between now and December on what the direction of the comic book industry is going to be well, as far as you know, DC, Marvel, Image, the traditional kind of comic books as they look at this other market that is firmly established and is absolutely beating the pants off of them. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just it. It, it, they, the, this, this new market that's come up doesn't need them. And I'm not saying this is a, you know, depressing, uh, an attack on Marvel and DC. It's just, it's established very firm footing. And in many ways it's exciting because it's going to give people who are not part of Marvel and DC a chance to go play in that market and make a lot of money and, and have, have a, a channel to, to do this. Uh, it, you know, all these pieces come together and I think there's a, there's a, there's a great opportunity for others. Um, and you, you didn't, uh, you know, one of the other factors in all this is we look at kind of book channels, comic stores, digital downloads, others, you know, one of the talking points we've heard a lot of is around what kind of role um, crowdfunding or, or Kickstarters, Indiegogo's uh, play into all this. And it is, a, it is a factor in this picture. Um, but in many cases, I guess I look at it this way. Um, it it kind of gets lumped into the 25 million bucket with uh, the newsstand, which can't be very much, honestly, of, of sales and a few other things. Uh, maybe some of the Walmart plays in there. I'm not sure if that's where they're counting that. But the interesting part about what's going on, I think, with Kickstarter and Indiegogo is a lot of people are getting some experience in putting a book together, getting a product, and, and getting it formatted. And most of the things that are coming out would fit into that graphic novels category. They're crowdfunded, but the format is a graphic novel. So it's a one shot or a larger book. And I think what's happening is you're getting a lot of people with some experience on how to build those things that can, if they play their cards right, have the right method in or agents, whatever else, they could, they'll start to play in that graphic novels bucket. And a lot less barriers for entry as far as gatekeeping from uh, people that yeah. don't, want this, don't want outsiders in, right? Well, yeah. And, and I mean, just even beyond the gatekeeping from a pure financial standpoint, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that's going into that graphic novel sales is the creators owning their work. So you're not sharing your your money with a, a publisher or you're not using somebody else's IP. I mean, the reason why you want to use somebody else's, you know, a, a Batman or a Spider-Man or those kinds of things is that 
you know, in, in the past, it's been a higher guaranteed sale because it's an established character. But now what we're seeing in this graphic novels format and, and kind of some of these other channels is that it is possible to be successful and get your book out there and get some recognition, even if it's not an established IP. So you, you get to keep a lot of those dollars yourself. So uh, for the people who are doing kind of uh, Kickstarters or Indiegogo's or any of that, um, it is, it, this is, for lack of a better word, this is training to what potentially can be a much bigger channel for you to sell in. You know, nothing wrong with some of the people who've had successful campaigns, but if you can start to get your uh, your content into Scholastic or into into some of these other worlds, and maybe the markets don't completely fit, but it's it's just it's another channel, and it's one that does not have the baggage as a historical channel. And I think that's going to be an interesting and very promising thing. Uh, no, I do not believe that uh, crowdfunding, and I've said this before, I don't think crowdfunding is the, the wave of the future. I don't think we're going to see a huge crowdfunding uh, bar come up here. But I think the content that's being made there will slip into some of these other channels and will be very successful. Yeah, it translates very well. I agree with you, my friend. Obviously, this video went a little bit longer than normal, but uh, a lot of stuff to kind of parse through here. Some narratives that we had to burst, and uh, I think we, we gave a good accounting of everything that we see. And obviously, we'll keep an eye on what, everything that's happening and, and readdress it again here in a few months. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me on.